Welcome everyone to worship. We are so glad that you're here with us. We're going to worship in a way that is fun. We're going to worship in a way that is meaningful. And because you're here, our worship will be better. So thank you. If you'd like a worship bulletin that has all the songs that we'll be singing, you can download it from our church website. It has all the words as well as the accredi accreditations. As you may know, there are many people out there just reeling from what's happening. And there are a lot of people who are in need. And our church is, continues to respond to those needs and continues to provide ministry. If you'd like to contribute or make a donation to the ministry of our church, you can do so in these ways. We'd also love to hear from you. We miss being with you, and we'd love to know how you're doing. Please send us a, a word, either through email, send us a, an attach, a, a photo if you'd like. Um, just tell us how you're doing and let us know. You can also uh, sign up for our twice a week e-blast newsletter that contains all of the updated information. So you can sign up uh, here on our website. On Sunday of this week at 1030 in the morning, we will have another coffee connection. This is something that we get to enjoy each week um, together on Sundays at 1030. All you have to do to join Coffee Connection is go to our church website, find the link, which is a Zoom link located in our calendar. Now you can come and bring your own coffee, you can bring your own donut holes, you can even wear your PJs if you want. That's not required, but you can if you'd like. We'd just love to see your face and talk with you. Now, friends, please prepare your hearts, your minds, and your souls as we prepare to worship God together. Friends, please join in our call to worship. Come sing to God, all who hunger for life. For it is God who nourishes us at the table of grace. Come sing to God, all who thirst for justice. For, for it is God, God who empowers us to do what is right. Come sing to God, all who long for peace and hope. For it is God, God who transforms, transforms us from death, death to, to life. life. Come, friends, come sing to God with thanksgiving and praise. Stahoviak family. 
Hey everyone, it's Dave Stahopiak, and I have here Luke and Hannah to tell us about their 4th of July experience. So Hannah, would you tell us what you did for 4th of July? We played with sparklers, yellow, goldish, red, and green, and we also played with poppers with yeah. fake gunpowder inside them. Yeah, the little ones you just throw on the ground. And we yanked them on the ground. What did you think of those? Fun. Yeah, we've never had those before. That was fun. We got to watch real fireworks from San Juan Catastrophe. We did. We saw that. Okay, Luke, tell us about something you remember from Fourth of July. What was fun for you? I played a bunch of Minecraft, and I played with glow sticks. Yeah, and you've even got the right Minecraft shirt on for it. Okay, great. And also, I did the same thing as Hannah. Yeah, we all did it together. It was fun. All right, thanks, everyone. We had a few videos from our Stahoviak family and they went on to explain how uh, Lucas is actually connecting with some of the other children in the church through the game of Minecraft and how they have met a new friend in India through that game as well. So um, they're doing much more than just wasting time on the internet. They're making community and that's a beautiful thing to see. So friends, we're now in our fourth month of worshiping virtually rather than in person. And there's a lot that we miss. In addition to missing each other, we, we miss entering the space that we have all come to, to hold in our hearts as sacred space, as our together space. Worshiping virtually means that we have to take an extra step. It means we have to create a space that we can often take for granted when we come on to the church building and its campus. So I'm going to ask you to take a moment right now to rearrange your space. Maybe there's a cross in the room you can bring and just make it a centerpiece. Maybe there's a Bible you can open. Maybe you've got some paper and pen nearby you can draw a heart. Maybe it's just fluffing a few pillows and relocating yourself, but I want you to create the space in a way that you're no longer just sitting in your living room or just sitting at your table, but that you are in that sacred space with us as we prepare to pray together. And if nothing else is working for you, then I just invite you during this prayer to, to assume a posture of cupping your hands as a way of demonstrating that you are ready to receive the abundance of God's Spirit in this prayer. So for our prayer, I invite you to allow yourself to enter a vulnerable space with trust that God will provide hope, healing for you and for the ones you love. So we're going to begin by singing together hearing a prayer, and then joining in prayer together.
we bring our weariness. We bring our fears. We bring our frustrations. And we bring our distrust. We bring our confusions, our pain, and our deep disappointments. We trust in your never-ending love, and we need your touch of grace. Hear us as we pray together. Your love for us sees the difference between the pain to behold and the person who we are. Your love for us hears our frustrations and cries over our failures. Gracious God, captivate us with the joy of pure love. Enable us to love as we are loved, trusting in your forgiveness and believing in your redemption for each person we encounter. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. The God who dances with us when we rejoice is the God who cries with us when we are broken. Welcome God's love. Let it heal you and strengthen you for the journey. In response to God's grace, let us express our joy by singing together, Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. The Gospel according to Mark, Whoa. chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. Back up one more. Okay, come forward. Oh, still. <laughs> Friends, our scripture reading today really wants to be heard. <laughs> so we're going to let it be heard. It's a fascinating story with three very distinct parts. And I'm going to get out of the way so you can hear it. The Gospel according to Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. A girl restored to life, and a woman healed. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered round him, and he was by the lake. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. 
Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Will you pray with me? God of grace, give us that uncanny ability to bracket all the things we thought we knew and to listen anew to what your spirit is saying to your church today. Amen. So friends, Mark has a way of telling some of his stories that are shaped something like what we call a sandwich. And what that means is that Mark begins to tell a story, but then he separates that story and inserts another story in the middle. So I tend to refer to the first and last parts of the first story as the bread story, and then that middle story as the peanut butter and jelly story. All right, so we got ourselves a PBJ sandwich going here. And that's exactly what we have in our story, which is why I invited both Steve and Jenny uh, to read the story for us so that you could hear the two stories woven together. And the first story, the bread story, is a story of a man named Jairus, whose 12-year-old daughter is at the point of death. And the middle story, the peanut butter and jelly story that Jenny read, is the story of a woman who for 12 years has had a hemorrhage and has struggled mightily with it. So whenever we run into this sandwiching technique, Mark uses it three or four times in the Gospels. Um, whenever we run into it, it seems to me that the best way to read it faithfully is to honor the bread story and to honor the peanut butter and jelly story, but then also particularly to honor Mark's intention of weaving the stories together so that we don't hear them simply as sequential healing stories, but rather as two stories made into one sandwich. So that's what we're going to do today. If you would like to hear a fuller exploration of the bread story and the peanut butter and jelly story before we take them together, then I just invite you to go to our website and download this week's text study. It's about an hour long. And we, it's just me having a great time by myself. But we go into uh, exploration of all three parts of that story. For now, I want us to see how it is that the first story and the second story 
bring something out of each other. So we start with the bread story that Steve read for us, and it begins with a man named Jairus coming, and as soon as Jesus comes across the water in a boat, um, as soon as he gets off the ship, Jairus falls at his feet, and he's identified by name, which is a very uncommon thing in the Gospel of Mark, in a healing story for somebody to be identified by name. So that seems to signify that he's kind of a big deal in that area. And he's identified as a leader of the synagogue, which uh, doesn't necessarily make him a religious figure because the synagogue was used for a number of purposes. But it does, again, kind of reinforce the idea that, that this is somebody in that, that area. And, and, and maybe that, maybe that is what enabled Jairus to get to the front of the crowd. Because the first thing we hear is that when Jesus lands back on the Galilean side of the Galilean Sea, he's met with this huge pressing crowd. I want you to kind of feel that word, the pressing crowd. Mark uses a, an adjective that means like to be squeezed. So it, this is not simply a lot of people. This is a, an encumbering people. And Somehow or another, Jairus gets to the front of that. Maybe it's because he's a big deal, people let him through, or maybe because he's a really, really desperate father. Because even though he does get presented as kind of a, perhaps an elite, privileged person, what really draws us to this character is that he's a broken-hearted parent whose child, in his words, is in the very last throes of death. So he begs Jesus to come with him because his daughter is at the point of death. You hear that? You hear that desperation in his voice? And so, so the first part of the bread story ends with the acknowledgement that Jesus went with him. But we also know that there's a huge pressing crowd. So while there's urgency in Jairus' voice, urgency in the matter at hand because his daughter is just about to die, the challenge here is that they can't get there quickly and they have the crowd to deal with. And that's when Mark introduces the second story, the peanut butter and jelly story. It's a story about a woman who, it, she's often called the hemorrhaging woman or the woman with the discharge or the bleeding woman, something like that. But I, I pointed out in one of my St. Mark Minuscule Morning Moments on Facebook this week that Mark actually uses a bunch of participles to describe what she's been through. And yes, she's had this hemorrhage for 12 years. And yes, it does seem to be written in the language that it's a menstrual issue. And yes, that probably would make her unclean and able to go into the temple. But it also is a scourge for her. That's the word, the literal word that Mark uses to describe it. And she's had it for 12 years. And she's been through every kind of uh, physician imaginable. I can't imagine what they put her through in first century uh, medicine. And she's been impoverished by it all. And the upside is she hasn't gotten any better. But in fact, it's gotten worse and worse. So basically, for those 12 years that Jairus' daughter has been living, this woman's been dying. And Mark uses those participles to describe the, the, the genuine, true suffering of her life. But the verb that Mark uses, the, the word that really describes what she does, she's not just a victim. After all of that suffering, she grabs Jesus' garment. Um, our translation says touched, which almost sounds a little too innocuous to me because the word means to affix to something. She grabs his garment. Because she says to herself, if I can only grab his garment, I will be healed. And she grabs his garment from behind. She's in this pressing crowd. She grabs that garment. And immediately, it says, she recognizes in her body that the bleeding has dried up. And she's healed. That's her story. She had suffered. She had tried. She had gone to doctor after doctor. She had spent all she had. And yet she persisted. She grabbed his garment. And she was healed. And now we get to the part of the story where I really want to invite you to remember Jairus is standing there. 
and to remember that Jairus is, is impatient. There's urgency in his request. Remember that it's Jairus who begs Jesus to come quickly to his house because his daughter is in the last throes of life. And um, Jairus is standing there. And so when this woman grabs Jesus' garment and she's healed in her body, Mark says, Jesus stopped. Jairus is waiting because his daughter's dying. We've got to get through this crowd. We've got to get back to the house. And Jesus stops. And Jesus turns around and looks at the crowd and begins to ask, who touched me? Come on, who was it? Who touched me? So Jairus is standing there because he's in a hurry, because his daughter's dying. They've got to get through this crowd and get to the house because she's in the very last rows. And, and, and Jesus is quizzing the crowd. Who touched me? And his disciples think this is all ridiculous, right? I mean, you're in this pressing crowd, a squeezing crowd. Don't forget that. Everybody's touching them. And they look at Jesus and say, what are you talking about? Everybody in the world is pressing up against you right now. What do you mean, who touched me? So Jairus is standing there. He's in a hurry because his daughter's in the last moments of life. They've got to get through this crowd to the house. And Jesus has to stop and deal with this foolishness from the disciples. See what happens when we hold these stories side by side, all of these very deliberate things that are happening in this peanut butter and jelly story are pressing against the urgency of the bread story. So, the woman, <laughs> you gotta love this woman. I mean, she suffered for 12 years. She still had the gumption to grab a hold of that garment, right? And she could have easily kind of slunk back into the crowd and. You know, just stood there looking around saying, Well, I wonder who touched Jesus, right? She could have gotten away. She could have just gone on because she was healed. She didn't have to deal with this anymore. Didn't have to process it by any means. And yet, when Jesus says, Who touched me? This woman comes forward and tells him everything. Mark, Mark, Mark is very deliberate in the way he tells the story. She tells him the whole truth. Of the matter. So Jairus is standing there and he wants Jesus to hurry up because they've got to get to his house because his daughter's in the last moments of life and they need to get there desperately because she's just about to die. And Jesus is listening to this woman give an account of a 12 year life of woe. And when she's done, Jesus looks at her and says, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So Jairus is standing there, wanting Jesus to hurry up because his daughter, his daughter, is on the verge of death and they've got to get through this pressing crowd to his house and Jesus is taking time to adopt this newly healed woman as part of his family. And when Mark tells the story this way, what we get the sense of is that everything in the peanut butter and jelly story, everything about this woman's healing that is so deliberate and time-consuming seems to be taken away from the urgency that we've got to get to Jairus' house for his daughter's healing. And sure enough, when the bread story resumes, the very first thing we hear is that messengers arrive from Jairus' house and say, your daughter is dead. And it's hard to imagine anything that's more disruptive of the moral universe than for a parent to have to bury a child. And that's what we hear. And so far, this story really plays into the way we see the world. We follow what we might call the myth of scarcity. And in this myth of scarcity, what we believe is, look, Jesus, you've got Sophie's choice here. 
you can either mull your way through this crowd with me so we can get to Jairus' house in time to save this 12-year-old girl because everybody loves a save the child story. Or you can stop, you can ask silly questions, you can look around the crowd, you can have an ongoing conversation with a woman. We're happy for her, but good heavens, she's been putting up with this for 12 years. She doesn't quite have the urgency that that little child over there has. Or, you know, Jesus, you've got a choice. You can either get this done or get that done. But if you stop to adopt and heal this woman, it's at the cost of this child's life. Because in the myth of scarcity, it's competition, not compassion, that drives us. In the myth of scarcity, we can only have our comfort if others' lives are disrupted. In the myth of scarcity, we can only have our choice of insurance if others don't get free insurance. In the myth of scarcity, we can only have what we want insofar as others cannot have what they want. And up to this point in the story, when you play one story against another, it seems to fit perfectly into our myth of scarcity because Jesus chose to attend to this woman rather than to save this child. And you can only do one. But the story doesn't end there. Jesus looks at Jairus and he says to him, don't be afraid, but believe. And we've heard that word believe before. It's not just a common church word, but we've heard it here in the Gospel of Mark. When Jesus came preaching, his message was, the reign of God is here, at hand. Repent which means to change your way of thinking and believe in the good news of the gospel. So what he's offering right here in this part of the story is for Jairus and the rest of us reading this story, instead of buying into the myth of scarcity, to repent and change our way of thinking and believe in the myth of abundance. Now look, we can't blame Jairus if he's not there yet, right? This is the father who's just heard the worst news possible. And in fact, in my mind, he's been amazingly patient all along. It should have been Jairus who said to Jesus, What are you talking about? Who touched me? There's a crowd here. Don't worry about that. Let's go. It should have been Jairus who grabbed Jesus and dragged him toward his house. So, so bless his heart, Jairus has shown uncommon patience throughout this whole thing. And it's to Jairus that Jesus looks and says, don't be afraid, but believe. And they go to his house, and there's mourners there, and Jesus, uh, and Jesus does, he puts the crowd aside and tells them, stop it, and gets them out of the way. He gets to the house, tells the mourners to be quiet, throws them out of the house. He takes three of his disciples, not all twelve, because they are a pain in the butt. And he takes three of his disciples, and the mother and the father, and they go into the room, and there's a dead corpse of a little girl who Jesus has said, she's not dead. This is sleep. We're going to come out of this. And he takes her by the hand and he says, Talitha kum. And that, that means little girl, raise up. And she rose up. And she lived. And the woman up there was still healed. Because in the myth of scarcity, we can only have what we need if somebody else doesn't get what they need because it's all about competition and some kind of social Darwinism and fittest of the, uh, the survival of the fittest. But in the reign of God, where you and I are to repent and change our way of thinking and believe in the reign of God, is healing for this woman after 12 years of suffering and scourge. It's healing for this child. And we don't have to play one pain against another. In her book, Why Fragility, Robin DiAngelo says that one of the most common ways that white people in discussions about anti-black racism, one of the most common ways that we try to decenter that and recenter ourselves is by saying, but I've suffered too. 
or by pointing out in the ways that we've had to struggle to be who we are. And while that may be true, while that may be true, to imagine that our suffering has to be centered and then sideline someone else's suffering is another expression of that myth of scarcity. You and I are called into a very different way of thinking to where we live in the myth of abundance, that God's grace is sufficient for all of my needs and God's grace is sufficient for my neighbor's need. And insofar as I'm called to pray about my own needs, I'm also called to work and pray and live toward my neighbor's needs because, because it's not either or. God is abundant. And that's the God who calls us into life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, I invite you to join in singing a song that uh, many of us heard as we were children. I heard it in the tradition where I grew up. It's a song that we can sing with joy after hearing this story. What a friend we have in Jesus. this sacrament together and this is God's table not just here in our church but God's table exists everywhere including in your home friends this is the joyful feast for the people of God and our Savior invites all to share in this feast that he has prepared please join me in our litany of Thanksgiving the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the life-giving God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us sing our thanks to God.
us continue our prayer together. God of all goodness, we come to you grateful for the gift of your creation, for the beauty around us that reminds us of your kindness and sustenance all of your days, all of our days. We thank you for the gift of your son, born of Mary, ministering to those in need. We sing your praises for the gift of your Holy Spirit inspiring your church today and empowering us to make your voice heard even in these strange, strange times. We bless your name. We pray for your torn and stricken world in places that are economically depressed, Lord, we ask for relief. In hospitals that are overwhelmed, we ask for healing and protection. In streets that are too dangerous to walk, we pray for peace. In communities that are infected with hate, we pray for love. In families that are divided, we pray for compromise and reconciliation. In individuals who carry pain, we pray for strength and grace. And now, we pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and these gifts so that the bread we break and the wine that we drink will be for us the presence of our risen Christ. Amen. I invite you to take the bread that you have in your homes and to break it as I share these words of institution. On the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus sat in the upper room with his disciples. He took bread, blessed, and he broke it. And he gave it to his, to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, Jesus took a cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, that has been poured out for the forgiveness of all sins. Drink ye all of it, he said, in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the saving grace of our risen Lord. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. At this time, I invite you to take the elements that you have in your home and to partake of them. Consume your bread and juice as we enjoy the special music provided by Joanne Shaw and Alicia Adams.
Please pray with me. God of abundance, we are so grateful for all your blessings. Amen. Friends, let's conclude our worship by singing together the great hymn, We Will Walk With God. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the companionship of God's own Spirit be with each of you from this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>